tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the horror hell. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Look at that. It's time for your medicine again. And we wouldn't want to keep the doctor waiting on this particular house call. So without further delay, I give you chapters one through chapters four of Scott Wilson's acclaimed novella, The Pill Mills. Chapter 1. I'm going to try to get this started. Years ago, I worked in a pill mill and horrible shit began to happen in Florida. For those of you lucky enough not to know, a pill mill is a place where doctors pump out prescriptions for absurd amounts of painkillers and Xanax, bolstered by laws in Florida that allowed them to do so with no oversight. Before I go into what kind of horrible shit became commonplace there... I'll take a moment to describe this incredible den of narcotics, desperation, and depravity. Mine was called Executive Medical Solutions, and we gave each and every patient the same prescription, regardless of the injury in the x-ray or MRI they brought. 180 30 milligram roxycodone. 45 15 milligram roxycodone, 32 milligram Xanax and Soma, if they wanted it. We saw between five and six hundred people every day as they filed quickly in and out of that disgusting hole in the wall. Rick Scott, Florida's governor, furiously defended the pill mills, gutting several attempts to stop them. This went on for about seven years with the drugs mainly going to Appalachia and other states notorious for poor white trash. Patients, or pill billies, depending on who you ask, would shamble from their dusky trailer parks into filthy cars covered in plenty of dents and varying amounts of paint. They would cram as many people as possible and all drive to Florida to pick up their medication, usually with one drug dealer fronting all the money so they could sell the majority of the pills, often for $30 a piece for the 30s. 
Ever since I called that number on Craigslist and went for an interview one hour later without emailing a resume, I had a pit in my stomach. It was in a horrible part of town, the congested and strangely crowded center of West Palm Beach, in a strip mall that was almost entirely empty except for us, a Jamaican restaurant, and a massage parlor. Yeah, that kind of massage parlor. They actually complained to the cops about our patients going in to use the bathroom and passing out with needles in their arms. The normally empty parking lot was filled with junkies by four in the morning, every morning. If it wasn't for the absurd pay and free drugs, I would have noped the fuck out of there on the first day. The office itself was set up probably within 24 hours of the space being rented and I could imagine the cheap grey paint peeling within an hour of it drying. The furniture was of the cheap institutional variety, with a fabric design from the 90s that was barely visible from the myriad of crusted stains the patients contributed every day. The office consisted of one large room that was split between a waiting room and our check-in desk where I worked. The medicine room took the bulk of this area. It was locked filled with massive bank vaults that were filled with amazingly powerful drugs and some blonde girl named Jessica who filled the prescriptions while wearing a lab coat. She had previously been a Hooters girl. The manager, Debbie, was previously a stripper. It was just us and a rotating group of doctors who generally avoided conversation. At first, I thought it was because I knew I was doing something insanely immoral and illegal, while I am sure that is a part of it, I think I had picked up on something other than Aryan Brotherhood tattoos and a shit ton of money. Did I mention the shit ton of money and free drugs? With my habit, I'd be homeless in a week otherwise. I stuck around for a reason. The first day working was the day after my ten-minute interview with a beautiful but clearly very stressed former stripper named Deborah. Deborah had dark brown hair and enjoyed wearing expensive, slightly trashy, clothing that she would sometimes send me to pick up. Courtesy of her gangster boyfriend who ran with the Aryan Brotherhood and owned the clinic as well as five others through various patsies. Debbie opened the place up at five, long after the patients had gathered in the parking lot. The very first day should have been my last. I walked in at about 5.45 in the morning and was told that we did that because it made life difficult for the cops. I walked in to see Debbie behind the desk, getting wads of cash ready for the registers and someone off to the right at the end of the hallway with the bathroom used by the patients. I couldn't see because whoever it was looked like they were halfway in or out of the bathroom. Hey, I'm Wilkes. I waved towards the person in the bathroom and they seemed to shuffle forward. I know, I hired you yesterday. Remember? Hey, do you- Debbie was about to go on, but suddenly stopped when she realized I was talking to someone in the hallway. Her eyes shot up in terror. She glanced over to her left, but the wall in between her and that hall would have stopped her from seeing the person I had assumed was a co-worker. The lights were off in that hallway, but I got the distinct impression that whoever was there was wearing a mask or had something wrong with their face. I saw a distinctly round, pale face. Wilkes, uh, I need to go right now. Uh, get back to your car and go home for a minute. I'll pay you for this anyways. She was clearly suddenly panicked and rushed through the door with only her keys in her hand. I glanced over at the person moving slowly, almost shyly, down the hall, and Debbie almost jumped out of her skin. Look at your car, Wilkes. I turned around and looked at my car, hoping a junkie wasn't vandalizing it. No one was near it. Before I could turn around, I felt Debbie's hand on my back pushing me out. All right, all right. Shouldn't we wait for whoever? I was about to motion to the person who now seemed to be standing on one leg, fully outside of the bathroom now and in the end of the hall, bending at a 90 degree angle at the waist towards me, with their face still directly aimed at mine. Let's go. Just go home. Someone will call you when it's cool. 
She had already passed me while I stared. She was ahead of me now, but was suddenly dragging me by my arm towards our cars. She never looked back, and almost did a burn on the way out. The junkies lining the parking lot were baffled, and before I got out of the lot, I saw a line of junkies forming in front of the clinic, watching us. I saw the outline of someone else through the glass, too, but I couldn't make that person out. I thought I would just go ahead and never call Debbie again, but in four hours there was a heavy knock at my door. Two gigantic, roided-out muscle heads in bright blue and orange affliction shirts were standing on the other side, looking cramped between the massive lantana bushes that bordered my walkway. I almost didn't open the door, but one of them shouted, It's alright, we're friends with Debbie. I opened the door and nodded in their general direction, but before I could say good morning, one of them shoved two grand and twenties in my hand. One of the muscle heads had thick red hair, and the other had a shaved head, one cauliflower ear, and a nose that looked like it had seen quite a bit. Both had an incredible variety of tattoos and excessively tight, ripped, and overly besequined pants. I'm a pretty tall guy at 6'3", but each of these guys had a couple of inches on me and I wouldn't be shocked if someone told me that they were bodybuilders. Both also clearly had open carry permits or something because they were wearing massive guns on the side of those absurd jeans. They almost didn't look real, considering the rest of the outfits. Sorry for the inconvenience this morning. One of the patients hid in the bathroom and was probably hoping to rob the place or something. It's all taken care of now. You, um, you willing to show up tomorrow? Uh, same time? The redhead asked in a jovial tone, seemingly not expecting me to say yes. This explanation obviously didn't make much sense. The bald guy looked like he'd be just as happy to punch me in the face. Everything about this screamed bad idea but I knew I needed a lot of money. Um, yeah, yeah, I muttered, stunned as I counted the wad he had just handed me. Gray, the redhead seemed genuinely delighted. Listen, my name is Dave. I'm going to give you my cell. If you ever see that person or anyone else like them again, just give me a call no matter what. Debbie will fill you in on the rest. Debbie definitely didn't seem to want to talk about it, and we never did. After that, creepy became a norm. I got accustomed to the junkies, the drugs, the river of psychic sleaze that powered through Florida and into the rest of the country. Deaths were constant. Patients, or someone with a bottle of their medication, would be found dead all over the country. The cops would call and tell us what number to fax their medical records to. Some of them told us what they thought of our little operation, but most were professional and probably didn't want to screw up an investigation. Once, I got a call from someone claiming to be a detective, but it sounded like a little kid. The kid was giggling the entire time. They said a guy was murdered, horribly, and told me his head was ripped off and his guts were all eaten because something thought he sucked. I assumed it was a prank, especially because the guy they were calling about was sitting in the lobby, still quite alive. I hung up. Two days later, and a real detective called and told me the man's remains had been found. The detective this time sounded very genuine and extremely shaken. They didn't normally ask for any information other than the medical files, but she asked if anyone knew him or if we could tell her who he normally came in with. After I was finished talking to her, I looked up on the caller ID for the number that had called a couple of days ago. I don't know why I did this, but I hit dial the second I found the number, probably just out of impulse. I didn't put the phone to my ear, but I heard a horrifying yowling, almost like a cat, ripping from the speaker before I slammed the phone into its holster. After a couple of weeks, Dave stopped by and took me out to breakfast instead of my normal morning routine. We barely talked on the way there, but he told me that they were glad that someone stuck through it, and that there was a whole lot of room for advancement in the organization as long as I never pissed off George, Debbie's boyfriend and the head of the network. 
He also asked if I had seen anyone following me, presumably the police, before getting to the point. Listen, some stuff has been happening and I need you to tell me if you've seen anything weird. Anything at all. Especially in the mornings. Not just people. Anything. Uh, What do you mean? At first I thought he meant bugs or other potential listening devices, but then I remembered that creepy patient on my first day that no one wanted to talk about. He suddenly dropped the joking demeanor and looked as if I had just insulted his mother. You need to tell me if you have seen anything weird. Anything. A car where there shouldn't have been one. Any weird lights on your way to work. People doing anything. Weird. And you need to tell me this shit right the fuck now or the split second you see anything. Anything. I raced through my memories and remembered the creepy kid. I told him about that, but even he didn't seem to know what to make of it. He seemed to relax a bit, though, knowing that I had made an effort to remember anything helpful. Alright. There is something else. His voice cracked slightly and he shifted from intimidating to intimidated in less than a second. There's, um... There's been this guy coming around... He's dressed like a Mormon. He acts real nice. He wears a bolo tie and one of those pieces of leather that Texans wear sometimes and has a comb over. If you see this guy, do not say one word to him. Not one fucking word. No matter what he says or does, you say nothing. He's going to come in, nothing we can do to stop him. But when he does... You help the person behind him in line and avoid looking at him in the eyes if you can. Let him talk to one of the other patients. He'll go away after he does. But do not even fucking say hi to this guy. You got that? Yeah. No problem. I didn't like talking to patients to begin with. I thought maybe this was someone who pissed him off and he didn't want his business anymore. But, he seemed almost terrified by the time he was finished telling me. We finished our breakfast burritos and headed back. Sure enough, about four days later, the guy came in. He had shocking blue eyes, blonde hair and a flawless comb-over, although he didn't seem to need it. His hair was thicker than a border collie's. And a white, long-sleeved shirt tucked into immaculate blue pants with very thin white stripes down their sides, and a bolo tie with what looked like a piece of turquoise surrounded by ivory. He was smiling ear to ear, and each of his teeth were radiant. He may have been the only person there with a full mouth, other than the doctors. He looked like he was ready for a very nice church. Debbie saw him too. And she looked terrified. She grabbed me by the shoulder before he got to the counter. Don't. Just don't. She said, urgently. I nodded, despite him being easily the least creepy person in the room by far, including in comparison to myself. It was at that moment, however, that I noticed that several other people, patients, were also horrified. One old woman with track marks running up both arms turned around and walked straight out when she saw him, and the room got quiet quick. Good morning, friend, he beamed at me. I motioned to the woman behind him, who didn't seem to know who he was. She was happy to check in instead and told me her name so that I could look up her file. Uh, Excuse me, but could you help me, please? He seemed just as confused as anyone else would be who had just been rudely ignored in favor of a junkie, except he was suddenly talking in the direction of the woman. She looked from me to him and then back again, but quietly continued her check-in, taking her pack of papers and sitting down, clearly sensing something was wrong. I'm having a bit of trouble and I was wondering if anyone might be able to help me. Please? He began to sound worried, but I noticed he was still staring at the area where the woman had previously been standing. 
He also looked in my general direction, but seemed to look right through me, as if he couldn't quite see me. I motioned for the next person while a fat hick with a confederate flag tattoo ambled up to the man. Might be able to help. What's up? The man's speech was slurring and his eyes roomy, most likely from a solid dose of his medicine or lack thereof. The well-dressed man turned to him sharply, put his hand on his shoulder. How do I leave? What? The patient was wondering whether this was a legitimate question or some kind of weird junky thing, as is common, and double-checked the man's immaculate outfit. How do I get out of here? Please? Please, there has to be a way out. The well-dressed man seemed frightened now. Debbie began to pull me away from the counter slowly, and when I looked at her, she had her finger over her lips. Door's uh, over there, man. At this point, the patient had realized that maybe there was a reason no one else had spoken to the man. He pointed the man to the door, and the man looked him in the eyes and smiled happily. Thank you so very much. He happily bounded out of the office. Everyone else went back to normal, except Debbie, who ran into her back office to do as much of whatever as possible. The next morning, there was a paper envelope in front of the door. Inside was a handwritten note simply saying, He lied. Next to the envelope was a small bit of something like leather with what looked like the confederate tattoo the patient that tried to help the well-dressed man had. It was perfectly dried and looked like some kind of weird art project. When I looked up from these things, I desperately tried to pretend I didn't notice the well-dressed man standing in the middle of the road that divided the parking lot, staring at me. I don't think he was smiling anymore. Debbie told me she would deal with it, because we sure as fuck didn't need the cops around, but I never heard about it again. We saw junkies doing a lot of fucked up stuff, but one of the worst things was when people brought their kids into this narco playland. Once a young redhead mother and her little boy came in. She looked a little disheveled, but not nearly as bad as most patients. We had to get her to pee in a cup, so she asked me to watch her kid while she went to the bathroom. I said sure, and just a few seconds later she came back. But she didn't have the pee cup in hand. She just smirked at me, took the little boy's hand and walked him out. I guess she decided not to do it because there was a line to go to the bathroom, but a few minutes later she came out, again, and this time she was looking for her little boy. Needless to say, she called the cops, but our security footage just showed the little kid wandering out by himself, and the cops blamed the mother. Apparently, they found the little boy's ear at the edge of the parking lot, but they kept putting up missing posters for a while. They eventually stopped putting new ones up, though. Chapter 2 Needless to say, I didn't really react well to the sudden upswing of death. After that thing with the kid's ear and the dude with the bolo tie, I started smoking a lot of pot, taking Xanax by the truckload, eating a Roxy whenever I felt like it, drinking, and eventually downing NyQuil every day just to avoid thinking about what was in front of me. The sheer quantity of what I was using was so immense that the idea of leaving was simultaneously enticing and horrifying, as there was no way I could afford even a single day without this job. Living this way can turn anyone into a creep. You don't feel like you're part of society anymore, and the only thing that makes you feel alright is the drugs. I had learned to hate leaving my home with an intense passion. Although the drive to work, I usually took the long route, 
Going to Palm Beach Island to watch the amazing cracks of dawn cover the beautiful tropical island with its relatively old architecture that looked as close to European as anything a Floridian junkie was likely to see. The sour stench of body odor from the patients increased in strength and viscosity until it became a miasma, warmed by the Florida sun and humidity by about two. After about a month, George sent a friend to us named Aaron to work the front desk so that I could scan medical records and organize the files full time. My new desk was unfortunately facing the wall, which placed my back to the waiting room whenever I sat down. On either side of the main room was a hall with bathrooms and a large storage closet. Opposite that, Another hall with four examination rooms where the doctors wrote the prescriptions in a small manager's office where Debbie hid to do drugs. Our own bathroom was between the medication room and the front office. Aaron was a relatively cool guy for someone who took a fuck ton of steroids and, of course, always wore brightly colored, extremely tight shirts with lots of busy tribal designs. I'm a pretty fat guy, so I have to admit I always felt insecure next to him. But I did get hit on a lot. This phenomenon had nothing to do with women being attracted to me at all. I had an absolute fuck ton of drugs and everyone knew it. I managed to bathe regularly, but I pretty much always looked like shit and was wasted 24-7. But gorgeous young women would still manage to smile and twirl their hair at me. Amidst the devastated junkies and constant feeling of hopelessness were stunning young women, often dressed in the short, skimpy clothing Florida tends to encourage. They rarely looked comfortable there and were usually in some varying stage of addiction, but they showed up every day. Hey, honey. Me and my friends have to go to a school thing. You think you can help me out? A stunning young redhead with long, cascading hair wearing a short orange skirt and bright turquoise tank top beamed at me from over the counter, hoping to bypass Aaron. He smirked and frequently encouraged this. He would go home with plenty of them. Yeah, um, sure. I stumbled over to the appointment wall where we stashed patient medical files on a first-come, first-served basis. I was incredibly aware of how awkward and socially stunted I am. I skipped her ahead. She wasn't from the state and they never were, but they frequently tried to act like they were going to school or working down here to cover for that. Hey honey, take my number out of my file. She leaned over the counter and gave me a look that no girl had ever given me, before winking and walking back to the doctor, ahead of the line. I didn't see her again until she left, but she bounced up to me when I was in the doctor's hallway after getting her medication. Thanks, sweetie, she said with a thick Appalachian twang. She kissed me on the cheek and pushed a note written on our office stationery into my hand before twirling around and walking out with the group of junkies she came in with. I didn't think anything of it because I was still unattractive, and the offers were either never genuine or were just in exchange for drugs. But still, she was painfully beautiful. A redhead with bright blue eyes and a face that faintly reminded me of some celebrity. At least in my head. The group she was with, in contrast, looked like a bunch of frightened hobos, most wearing the traditional camouflage and Walmart garb of the Appalachian people. I opened the piece of paper as I walked back into the main office and noticed that it simply said, Please call me Amber. With her phone number written below it, Please Call Me, was written in such a way that the pen had almost punched through the office stationery. The phone number, oddly enough, was a local one. I hated myself for it, but I absolutely had to call her. I told myself maybe she's in trouble. But they were always in trouble and just needed more medication to get out of it. Also, they would usually offer to trade for sex or at least insinuate it. When I got out of work, I called her the moment I got home. Hello? A frightened girl's voice asked. Hi, this is Ted from the doctor's office. What's up? I asked casually, expecting her to be more than happy to explain her horrible situation and how easily I could help her. Using a fake name was pretty standard, and Ted had already become second nature to me. 
Honey, please, where are you? Her southern twang was thicker than it was in the office, but it was her. She sounded more frightened than usual and I began to become aware of the fact that she may have a more genuinely frightening situation. The kind of people who crammed into those cars were usually broken human beings, easily taken advantage of by the ringleaders who drove them to Florida from Appalachia. What's wrong? I sat up suddenly, my old couch creaked below me. I uh, need to um, see you. It was obviously clear that she did not mean this in a flirtatious way at all, but was trying to phrase it that way. Where are you, honey? She asked again, quickly. Praying to God that I wasn't going to regret it and feeling a little disappointed that my deeply creepy fantasy seemed to be going nowhere, I gave her my address. Eventually, I heard an engine revving towards my home on the small street I live on and then revving away from my home. She knocked a moment after that. She was in a different outfit and makeup, a tight and small light blue dress and eyeshadow to match, but her dress had been ripped a little at the bottom. She had a deep purple handbag. Through my door's peephole, she was staring out at the road she had just come from, as if looking for something. I opened the door and moved aside so she could come in. Thanks, thanks. She muttered after sweeping herself inside and quickly sitting down on a recliner I had across from my couch where they both sat opposite a TV with a coffee table between them. She was almost shaking and looked like she had been through hell, despite her perfect makeup and nearly perfect dress. I need a... I'm sorry, she stammered, looking at the ground and not at me. I sat back in the couch. It's all right. You look like you're in some kind of trouble. Do you need help? I used the most reassuring tone a creep like me actually has. I doubted she would be able to call the police even if she wanted to. They would probably just arrest her for whatever part she had in her predicament. Yeah, I... I need... She sighed, looked at me for just a second and then went back to looking at the ground. I need help. Something happened when, um... My friend's dead. She come with us down here and she... She ain't got a way home because our ride got pissed at her. So she talked to this guy that looked good. He looked clean and she thought maybe he could give her a ride or someone who could cause... He, he looked clean and respectable and all. It poured out of her in a broken, stammering Appalachian drawl. She looked around the room desperately while she spoke. The moment she mentioned the guy looking clean, I thought of that dude with the bolo tie... Good holy shit. I did not need that motherfucker again. I began to wonder, just briefly, how exactly Dave knew he was coming to begin with. She gone. She gone and went with him. She breathed in with a deep shudder. Her long, thick red hair moved over her face when she looked at the ground and she made no effort to move it. She sobbed once, and the tears began to flow like a river. She thought he was safe because he seemed clean. She left American injury with him the day before yesterday and took her part of her meds. She took her meds and went with him. His name's Lyle. When they left together but she came back that night when we were in the motel, she pounding at the door screaming at us to let her in. We thought she wanted the meds Brody took to pay for her debt and ride her but before he even opened the door she was gone. Her bag was dropped, it spilled everywhere, but she was just gone. Nowhere in the parking lot, nowhere at all. I call her cell phone and I hear her screaming, but it just cut out and she don't pick up at all now. She was shaking and her makeup was pouring down her face. So her and her friends were going doctor shopping, taking advantage of the fact that Florida did not allow anyone to record how many doctors were prescribing to a single patient. This allowed Pillbillies to visit every clinic in the area on the same trip, especially American Injury Clinic, Georgia's massive flagship, and a thorn in the side of the DEA. And then someone called me from her phone and I just hear laughing and then some kind of screech and now we don't know where she is or who she's with. And everyone else, they just want to leave and pretend they didn't see nothing. 
That was actually probably the smart thing to do. The police were often just as dangerous as criminals, and I was slightly less effective at combat than a public sub. Do you think you should go to the police? I asked anyways, more to gauge the severity of her beliefs than anything. She stared at the ground, saddened. I mean, maybe. I gotta do something because they don't want to stay. They, they want me to stay with you at night and get more meds and leave. It suddenly sank in that all the girls flirting with me didn't really have a choice, or at least didn't perceive it that way. This would give me a chill of my spine every time a pretty girl smiled at me in the clinic from then on. More for Aaron, I guess. I have plenty of meds, that, that's not a problem. One way or the other, I could spare those at least. I reached the coffee table where a small plastic bag from work contained four large pill bottles. I began to pour a relatively generous amount of Roxycodone, Xanax, Percocet, and Soma into a plastic sandwich bag. For just a second, I wondered how many plastic sandwich bags were used for drugs and whether manufacturers actually considered this during design. Probably. Her eyes lit up just briefly when she saw the amount of men she was about to reap. I just wanted her to calm down and they were basically free for me. Oh... I'll call my people right, um, right quick, she said, slowly, still crying but unable to avoid focusing on what was the bottom line for what may have been her friends or family or maybe just some violent criminal she had to hang with. The line between the two was usually pretty thin anyways. She dialed and mumbled into the phone quickly and inaudibly. Thanks. Thanks. I don't know where Stacy's gone. I, I didn't see what kind of car that Lyle was driving. He looks so pleased with himself, too. Her accent forced himself to sound like himself. I poured some crushed Roxy for her and she got to work, taking in two entire rails. That took the edge off of her, and she was still weeping. As this shit tends to do, it makes you feel more resigned than at peace. She ain't even said where he from or going. I thought to myself that it might not be impossible to look up people named Lyle at American Injury, but that might not be his real name. But she said it was cool and she would just call later, so she stormed out after a fight with Brody and told him to go fuck himself. That's why he didn't take her serious when she come back like that. She said this defensively and I got the impression she regretted not taking her friend seriously too. From outside my door, I suddenly heard a deep, white trash voice. Samantha, it's me. Come outside. I was suddenly very aware that I didn't hear a car pull up. I wonder if they had just dropped off more people to keep her safe or to rob me. The fact that Amber was actually Samantha didn't bother me but the fact that he used her real name sent a shock of ice up my spine. That was a bit of a faux pas around people that you didn't know in the pill mills. If it could be avoided, that is. Fake IDs were constant, and we didn't have to check particularly hard to dispense medication. Brody? She seemed stunned. She looked to me as if for advice. She hadn't called her friend more than ten minutes earlier, or at least it seemed that way. Yes. Come outside, Samantha. His accent sounded as redneck as anyone, but there was something about how he didn't say yeah or really any slang at all, even in those short sentences. Just for a moment, Samantha. The voice didn't use a particularly reassuring tone, but it wasn't threatening either. She looked at me and got up. She walked to the door and I felt my innards seize with ice. If it was anyone other than who she thought, or he had any bad intentions, we were defenseless. I suddenly realized they didn't have a gun, but she opened the door and walked out. I heard her greet someone with a hey as she moved away from my house. At this point I really wished I lived in the city, but... I lived in a relatively isolated part of West Palm Beach in an area that was more Everglades and less beach. It's a huge county and I didn't mind the drive. I waited a few moments, 
The moments turned into minutes. The minutes dragged along and I got worried. First for her, then for me. After about 20 minutes, a phone call came in from my cell phone. It was her. I was massively relieved. This meant she had just taken her generous bag of pills and gone home. Without having to do anything other than cry, which for her was probably a good deal if she expected to get pills from me by her group. I stopped ringing almost instantly, and I suddenly felt the drugs floating in my system as the adrenaline receded. I chuckled and got up to flip the lock on my door. The second I flipped the deadbolt, thinking that was the end of the night for me, I heard a voice on the other side of the door. Immediately on the other side of the door. Wilkes, open the door! It was Samantha, and she sounded calm and clear. I turned around, but the sudden and gigantic pit of lead in my stomach compelled me not to bother looking through the peephole I normally made such use of. I wasn't sure what would be worse, seeing her there, or seeing something else. But the fact that I never mentioned my name, it's not actually Wilkes, but you get the idea, stuck out in my memory like a sore thumb. It was generally a bad idea for us to mention our names, because it made us easier to identify. Wilkes, could you open the door or come outside? I just want to talk for a second. There was a strange blankness in her questions. The voice from the other side of the door seemed to not know where to aim itself, and each word sounded like it was addressed to a different area of my living room. A thin layer of ice-cold sweat covered my torso and the back of my neck and every second seemed like an hour. I didn't dare answer. Wilkes, open the door or come outside. I just want to talk for a second. It sounded exactly the same as when she had said those words a moment ago, but stitched together differently. For a moment, I wondered if a crude recording of some kind was repeating her voice, but I couldn't imagine someone getting a recording of her saying my name to begin with. Seconds, or minutes later, her cell phone called mine again, and again, and again, and then it sent me a picture. I'm pretty grateful that my phone allowed me to delete that without viewing it. I stood next to the door, staring at my cell phone, terrified that whoever or whatever was speaking in her voice might hear a step. I kept staring at my phone every time the ringing started again as if expecting my phone to say, Just kidding, bro. She's probably fine. After a few minutes, I heard something rustle away from my door. I never heard another car pull up or anyone else. I called Dave the next morning. Jesus Christ. No, you, uh, you did the right thing, dude. You, you really did. He almost sounded impressed. He seemed to wave off the hints that I was dropping that something other than a person may have been at fault for this. Bro, if you get any other phone calls or any of that shit, just ignore it. You know these junkies and their drama. She got you for some pills, just let it slide. You'll see her again in exactly one month, just don't bring it up and be cool about it. Losing some pills is no big deal. He knew damn well that it wasn't the pills I was worried about, and I suddenly realized that although there was a chance of the phone call being tapped, he seemed happier to talk about drugs than weird shit. The thing is, she never did come back. I pulled the fake ID she used and she never showed for any of her appointment times at my clinic or any of the other clinics George owns. Because I didn't know her real name, I had no idea if there was anyone I could report this to that would make a difference. Or at least, that's what I tell myself. Things got worse quickly after that. I guess that was creepy enough to convince Dave that I was ready for some new responsibilities and a little more money, because that's what Debbie told me the next morning. I don't recall any other time in my life when a promotion left me filled with dread. 
This is how I began a much more open understanding of what was going on in the pill mills in Florida in general. Most of the days we left before three because we opened so early, at different times so that no one ever had to work more than nine hours. One time that didn't go as planned. Leox, we have a problem. Debbie didn't even bother looking up when I came in. She was chest deep in junkies trying to check in but dropped the papers in her hand and motioned for me to go to the medicine room with her. Serious business. We're getting an inspection tomorrow. She stated this with such terror that for a second I thought she was hoping for an answer from me. We were technically legal, but only because the authorities had no legal ability to second guess a doctor for prescribing anything they wanted, even if it had nothing to do with their field to begin with. Pharmaceutical companies fiercely defended this sacred right as something that kept our medical professionals functioning at a necessary speed and with necessary flexibility for doctors. We have to go through the inventory. We might need to make some deliveries. By we, I mean you. Sorry about that. She took a deep breath after she said that. I got a bad feeling about this right away. The different pill mills all controlled by her boyfriend George had to move fast to make sure each pill was accounted for, even if the accounting was hilariously flimsy. The process was largely written by a pharmaceutical company with no interest in the DEA's goals to begin with. Yale Pharmaceuticals, through an account representative named Rhonda, coordinated with us on exactly how to pass this. They also made sure the representatives that were required to send only came after store hours so they wouldn't have any reason to report the army of junkies in the parking lot. There were tons of tricky little things that at every step of the process to buying as many painkillers as you needed, just as long as you did it in bulk. We need at least 15,700 malleys, a lot of fentanyl, Xanax, you know, shipped to the American Injury Clinic. We have to make the books right. We're two and a half ahead. Being 250,000 ahead in cash was a serious problem for this kind of business. Malincroct was a particular brand of Roxycodone that was well known for their easy breakdown and comfortable inhalation. It was entirely possible for pharmaceutical companies to make additives that would make injection a lot less likely. But you see how it is. The American Injury Clinic was a massive building, a former school that dealt exclusively in painkillers and was the heart of George's empire. It pumped a vast river of narcotics into Ohio. East Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and everywhere else that had a lot of Confederate flags and not many jobs. I'm going to need you to grab at least two trips. She said that as both an order and a question, wondering if I would go through with it and clearly watching my reaction. I needed about 160 milligrams of Roxycodone and 6 milligrams of Xanax just to feel normal at this point, every day. To put this in market terms, it would be what non-junkies refer to as insanely fucking expensive. No problem. I stared her straight in the eye so that we both knew I wouldn't be putting up the bill for my own habit anytime soon at the expense of God knows how many others. She nodded and left me, and I went back to the wall, grateful that this meant a couple more hours of me getting to face my wall. This was towards the middle of November, so the days were getting short. I had never worked past 3.30 or so in the afternoon, and usually started before 7, almost always before sunrise. The bags will be ready. I have the doctor's powers of attorneys. Getting a physician to give a criminal power of attorney over their affairs was a critical part of the business plan that allowed them to store massive amounts of medication on hand. I decided to never ask how they got that. If anyone knew I was making the drive, I could be guaranteed to be robbed and killed. Also, as far as they knew, I might just try and drive off with a few million in merchandise and cash. The cash, legally speaking, did not exist which made it a particular point of anxiety. The pills, legally speaking, 
had been resting in their destination the entire time, and if the authorities knew that we had to play an insane balancing game, we'd be toast. Knowing that my mother could get killed, I could get sent to prison, I could run out of drugs right away, and I'd get extra pay if I did the job. It was a solid way to keep me honest, though. Alright, just let me know when I go to the clinic. You're not going to their clinic. You're doing a dead drop on the island. Drop it at the golf course in front of the schoolhouse and go. In addition to the possibility of being robbed, now the possibility that the dead drop could simply be taken by a group of teenagers existed. The island in question didn't need any introduction to anyone in South Florida. Since the Kennedys reigned, Palm Beach Island was a host to a crowd of wealthy, aging, and disconnected white people. The golf course had a small schoolhouse on it, left over from the days when Henry Flagler built the first railroad into the area. He also had a small village built for his black workers right on the island, and when he didn't need them to build a railroad anymore, he invited them to a party, and while they were gone, he had men burn their homes down and kill anyone who had a problem with it. Then, he built a tiny little schoolhouse right on the spot. While the poor black people were forcibly moved to an area called Riviera Beach in central West Palm Beach, where they were never heard from again. Suffice to say that schoolhouse is now in what is generally considered the more expensive part of town, a wealthy enclave with nicer, older architecture. Alright, I pretended I didn't have a huge problem with this. Good luck. Her voice wavered at that. She didn't seem happy with this either, but she wouldn't turn away from the counter to tell me about it to my face and I wasn't going to force her to. I went about my day and waited for bags of cash and drugs to be prepared by George's henchmen. Different guys this time, same amount of muscle and brightly colored affliction shirts. They didn't say a word and were gone in minutes, leaving three large duffel bags and two small duffel bags. I quietly drove around the back of the building where Debbie and I loaded the bags as quickly as possible. It was a small alley between two buildings, so it was relatively assured that no one could see us. Wilkes, if you see anything, anything at all, you need to call Dave. The red-headed hulk had appeared more than once as a representative of George, sometimes giving Debbie orders, and was usually very easy to like once you forget that he probably had hurt people for money before. Are they worried about me getting robbed? Because dead drops are generally a bad way to go with that. She smirked, so I guess that a robbery genuinely wasn't on her mind because otherwise she would have gotten serious. Just let him know what you see. Now she was being serious, I was suddenly deeply worried. I had already seen plenty, and this could have been a really convenient way to get rid of a no longer needed liability. But I was at the end of the long stretch without a pill, and I knew in the back of my head that I didn't really have a choice, unless I wanted to be shitting myself in a hospital bed in no time. I nodded and got in the car. She banged at the trunk when it was loaded and I drove off. The sun was going down, turning Florida's sky into an explosion of pinks, oranges, purples, and blues that defied that imagination. I drove through West Palm Beach grateful that the rivers of SUVs and economy sedans were moving in the opposite direction towards the residential areas of the county. I headed down a massive bridge in between relatively large towers and a small, absurdly expensive private Christian college across the intercoastal waterway from Palm Beach Island named Palm Beach Atlantic University. Creepy little place. The sky over the ocean was jet black by 5.30, making it look like the city was on fire with some kind of incredible burst of neon turquoise and angry fuchsia. These colors reflected on every single pane of glass and ivory surface in the small, beautiful island town. I drove down the jet black coast until I reached the curve in the single road in the island that let me know the golf course was coming up. I slowed down and briefly checked behind me for any other cars, but the curving road and the thick vegetation made that futile. By the time I got to the golf course, I had made my peace with the fact that if I was followed, 
I was too unaware of it to do anything about it. The parking lot was empty, but there was a slight indigo glow coming from the beach that I assumed was from high school students getting drunk or high. Sure enough, I heard laughter, some music and talking from that direction after I put the first bag down where I was told. After the second, I noticed that the talking seemed to be coming closer to me, and I looked up. They kind of looked like kids. They were small, at least they looked that way from the distance. Two of them were wearing what looked like brown shabby pieces of loose clothing from the distance, while the third I couldn't really make out but seemed to be dressed in white. There were three of them that I could see in the hill that buffered the beach from the rest of the island. I kept my head away from them in case the cops would end up asking them what I looked like and move the bags into a crevice between the pavement of the parking lot and school as fast as possible. By the end of the bags, I realized that I no longer heard any music, talking, or laughing. If the sound of footsteps creeping up on you is bad, the sudden lack of sound from someone you know to be there while you're committing a felony is a thousand times worse. I looked around, expecting to see someone, but those kids were gone. I dropped the last bag and slung my fat ass into the driver's seat. I spun the wheels just a little, accidentally trying to get out of there quick and prayed to God that a cop didn't hear it. As I pulled out of the parking lot, I noticed in my rearview mirror one of the kids staring at me. It was the one in white, and he was standing on top of the schoolhouse I had just pulled away from. The only light was a parking lot light in between us, so it was difficult to see, but I know it was staring at me. The kid was standing on one leg, his entire torso bent at the waist and his face turned up at me, just like the person in the bathroom. I saw a bright, pale, oval face, but couldn't make out any of the features turned up at me at an unnatural angle like something out of Cirque du Soleil. I didn't give a shit about the cops anymore, hit the gas a little. Never hit the gas when you're not looking through the front windshield. Basic rule of driving. Almost right away I heard a terrible thud and something got pulled underneath my 1986 Monte Carlo. A blast of what looked like brown cloth or feathers went everywhere. A sickening snap underneath my car let me know that I may have just crossed a serious line in life. The adrenaline was so much that I had no idea what to do. I drove. I swerved to my left, almost off the parking lot to get away from whatever was underneath me. I furiously threw the wheel in the other direction to aim myself back at the exit again and hit the gas again when I heard something smack the roof of my car. Something off to the left of me seemed to swing something at my car. A brown blur struck the window right behind my head and blew out the glass. I heard something that sounded like either an old church organ horribly misfiring, or several people wailing at the same time from the beach. I was out of the parking lot by the time I heard it, though. I had no interest in whatever was making it. Despite having potentially killed a kid... I felt very strongly as if I was the one who was going to be a victim tonight. I sped like crazy until I was off the island. The whole sky was jet black then, with just the lights from the towers looming over West Palm Beach. Then I drove at exactly the speed limit, as if the shattered glass wasn't even there. I didn't even turn on the radio or air conditioning during the ride. There were oily looking feathers in my front grill when I got home. The roof had deep grooves scratched into the metal right behind where my head was. There was a smell coming from the car that reminded me of the smell of dead fish in an overused and undercleaned pier. When I got home, I called Dave right away and told him everything in one very long sentence. He didn't seem surprised at all. How many of them were there? He calmly asked. Three? I, I don't know. Two, other than the one I hit. He chuckled at that. I don't know what happened to the bag. I was horrified at the prospect that my employer might take such a loss personally. But if the bags weren't picked up, 
he gave no indication. Listen, I'm not going to stop over there and neither is anyone else. I breathed a sigh of relief. I took this to mean that he wasn't going to hold me accountable, at least not right now, for the loss. So, if you hear me outside of your house, or Debbie, or anyone else you're not expecting, do not leave your house. Even if you hear me telling you that it's alright and that we need your help, you do not set foot outside of your house unless we call you on your cell. Don't worry about the bags or the cops. You did good. Don't worry about coming in for a while. Just relax. How much water do you have at your place? I checked quickly. I had ten gallons and two large five-gallon containers. I got ten gallons. All right. Sit tight for a couple of days at least. Don't go out. And I'll be by on Tuesday to drop off more water and let you know what's going on. For now... You did good, though. Oh, if you happen to look outside a lot, try not to do it from nighttime to the early morning. Especially not the morning. He cleared his throat loudly while I wished I could make myself believe he was talking about the cops. I wondered how much of what was happening he understood and from where. So remember, never go out in the morning. The morning worms are for the birds. He hung up. That last statement ended up scaring the shit out of me until I had enough Xanax in me to kill a donkey. But he hung up right away after saying that, leaving me wonder whether I was in danger if I did leave the house and from what. About a minute after he hung up, I heard a scraping sound coming from my roof. Brief, but clear. Six days later, when I was given the all-clear, I found horrible smelling greasy white feathers in the gutter right over my door. After that, Dave seemed to gain some trust in me, possibly because I was shit terrified, taking drugs to hide it and not asking questions. In retrospect, I was, for the first time in my life, what an employer would consider a model employee. I got a huge raise. A call girl sent to my place as a gift and a ton of drugs. This soon became apparent because I was clearly the organization's go-to guy for extremely weird shit. Christmas was just around the corner, and apparently Santa decided it was time for me to pay up for years of missed coal opportunities. At that moment, though, the only thing on my mind was getting Dave to talk in person so I could learn whatever he knew about this shit because he seemed to know when and where these things would be, at least. Chapter 3 I was mainly stunned for about a week after that. Once and again, a gigantic mute bruiser in nuclear green and purple handed me a bag with money and drugs and said to let them know when I felt good to come back. Dave did not respond to my texts during this time, and Debbie just told me to rest up and tell her when I could come in because she didn't want to talk about it over the phone. I began to rack my mind for experiences of situations that I could at least Google. It was difficult to tell which parts were Floridian junkie mythologies, in which came from people reacting to something genuinely weird, whether they had their facts straight or not. Everyone used to say that the area that is now Bryant Park in the expanse of Lake Worth was deeply haunted. Bryant Park is an increasingly beautiful suburban park on the intercoastal waterway. It borders Lake Worth, a formerly poor neighborhood that still has really bad parts and rough roads, but has been increasing in value thanks to the older homes which are frequently easy to renovate thanks to concrete block construction. It's a beautiful old neighborhood, with a distinct style formed out of the blocky homes and frequent use of pastel colors. It used to be a great place for the homeless to crash, as Lake Worth used to be a lot cheaper. It still is, but not as much. If you were out at the park at night, you had to be careful because things that looked like people would occasionally come out of the water in the summer, and for some reason, only in the summer, 
turn and face the seawall that lined the walkway with their backs to the park and wait for people to get close to them. When someone did, they would see something that looked almost human, but with a giant mouth filled with large blunt teeth, oddly shaped eyes, stringy wet hair and slimy, pale skin. There had been plenty of missing homeless from that area, and every now and then the area underneath the Lake Worth Bridge, which crosses the Gulfstream Hotel and goes over the park, was sealed off by police, who had presumably found something there. It was absolutely agreed upon that the Gulfstream Hotel had a man living in it, despite being boarded up for who knows how long. He would stare angrily down at passers-by, and if you tried to get his attention or willingly made eye contact with him, he would motion for you to come up to him. I've never met anyone who went past the first flight of stairs and went any further, though, as that creepy old building was built with the old Floridian rule of air conditioning. Make it as drafty as possible, and preferably out of wood even in places it shouldn't be. This made it creaky, and therefore creepy. This meant the wind screamed throughout the building, but I remember one guy named Andy, who's now a physician, who told us that it sounded like a person whistling something. I remembered a girl I went to John I. Leonard with, Megan Water, an adorable long-haired brunette who was into Radiohead and who I used to score weed from. She started dating some older guy on the island. I remember this because the cops came around asking the people on her phone and text history if anyone knew his name or what he looked like. The top part of her head, missing the bottom jaw, had been found hanging from her hair from a streetlight near Detura, which was a largely desolate street at the time near Clematis Boulevard. Clematis is a tiny, pathetic strip of ever-changing clubs and restaurants across the water from the island. They've made it a hell of a lot nicer these days. I heard Megan Water trying to break up with her older creep boyfriend and was really afraid because he wasn't who he said he was. One of the worst rumors was that he demanded that she marry him so that they could move away together, and when she said no, something began stalking her. Her friend said she was really afraid in the days before her death. I almost remember John Parks, a stupid junkie who was into theater and a lot of drama. I never liked him, so I never paid attention to the fact that he was killed in a hit and run near the breakers. But they found pieces of him in Manila Pan, which was down the ways by a normally beautiful 20 minute drive. They found those pieces months after he was killed. Some of the stories about how they died were pretty horrific. I thought they were just cruel high school bullshit at the time. I remember hearing that John Parks was seen screaming and trying to get someone's help the night he died, waving to people from across the Royal Palm Way, from the path that leads to the Flagler Museum. But when they caught up with him, it was someone else, who claimed they hadn't seen a thing. Some of the stories didn't even need a death for an origin. It was widely understood when I was growing up that the schoolhouse I would now be avoiding for the rest of my life was, in some way, haunted. I had never really paid attention to that, but I remember Stimpy, a kid from high school who was an idiot, a basket case, and obsessed with occult stuff, and in that order, unfortunately. He had insisted that not only was the place deeply haunted, but that Hobe Sound had even worse things. Weird ghosts who wore insanely colored masks and hunted humans, or made bargains with them. I can't remember all of what he said, but I've been googling it and I can only find bits and traces. I remember him telling us about people made out of sand who would try to imitate humans and a demon that haunted the Wellington Green Mall. As I said, it's pretty difficult to tell which parts had any inspiration that was genuine because most of it was bullshit. There were urban legends about Native American spirits that still haunted the land dead slaves, and other victims of Flagler who kept looking for revenge or solace and other stranger spirits that had less clear definitions. Jessica, the blonde who was hired by Dave to run our medication room, mentioned something about reading up on that stuff. 
She came from Hobe Sound and got interested in missing persons reports when a girl in her high school went missing. A lot of people were contacted by a girl who went to school in Hobe Sound and who apparently had spent her last moments trying to contact someone to get help. They claimed she said she was horribly wounded by something that came out of the sky and was afraid that it was hunting her. I'm still looking for any bits left on the internet about that. Her friends posted something on Facebook because they felt like the cops ignored what they told them about the girl's last phone call and decided she probably just ran away. Still, I had no idea which of these stories was even based on truth and even then I really doubted their accuracy. The people I hang around couldn't be expected to report what color the sky is accurately. Aside from the deaths, I wasn't sure there was any truth at all. But I did want to avoid the Lakeworth area from now on. After about four days, I got my car in the shop and googled my own name to see if I had a warrant for running over a kid. Nope. Not a single thing. I almost hoped I would get stopped by a cop just to see if anything came up. The suspense made it hard to focus. After I got my car window fixed and the vehicle detailed, I started to pay a lot more attention to the patients and the weird stories they always told. They had previously, sadly, assumed these things to be bullshit, but there was no chance that my employers hadn't heard the same stories. Did Dave or Debbie or George know what they were sending me into? I knew I had to confront Dave, who seemed higher on the totem pole than Debbie about what exactly he knew. I wanted to gather more information. It seemed like everyone around me knew of a vast system of weird shit that I had only yet seen the edges of. Debbie knew to get the fuck away from that bird thing. Dave knew that creep with the bolo tie, whose name I really hoped was Lloyd because at least that would consolidate the sources of creepiness, was coming, but not to talk to him, and I was willing to bet there was plenty more. I needed to talk to some junkies. He still hadn't returned my text about talking to him one-on-one, -on -one, but now that I was back at work, I was certain he would come around soon and I needed more to ask him about. Most of them wanted nothing to do with anyone, since they were quietly but openly committing a felony, but some of the miscreants who came in smaller, less regular groups that were cut off from the herd were chattier. They were always more than happy to talk especially since I worked for the people who handed them pills. The amount of people involved in moving these pills up what was called the Blue Highway was absolutely staggering. Tens of thousands of people were directly involved in driving from Appalachian states to Florida in order to procure drugs to resell at home. Middle-level dealers recruited low-level junkies of all stripes to go down to Florida and many of these people were impoverished, uneducated, frequently mentally ill white trash. The runners usually came from trailers that were little more than thin tin shacks for homes or dilapidated homes left over from an era where people in that area could afford to build them. At home, it wasn't rare for them to go without electricity and sometimes even running water, but they always managed to get their pills. Some of them went missing from time to time. I heard dozens of weird stories pretty much right away. The most consistent definitely involved the man wearing the bolo tie. I asked some regulars who were there at the time about him, a fat couple from Ohio with more track marks than arm skin. The balding old man in camouflage and his wife, who, I shit you not, came in wearing a bright orange muumuu with brilliant flowers. Henry and Louise Tompkins you could smell either from about ten feet away. Hey, that guy with the nice get-up and the Texas tie? He ever say anything different? The old man put down his gigantic soda and looked at his wife in consultation. She nodded sagely to him, keeping her eyes fixed on me from behind her big red glasses. He leaned over to me even though we were the only ones there. Nah. Hear from someone else that he came up from some people in Jacksonville at Josh Rhodes Clinic. Kept bothering them about how to leave and where are they and whatnot. <sighs> Weird fucker. 
He shot his wife another look, this one far more dire, and the obese old woman nodded one more time, this time only slightly. Heard he got a couple of them. Can't talk to him. Can't say nothing. Don't know what he's looking for. Always dress the same. I heard more or less the same thing from a couple of people. One person told me it happened in a motel and that no one saw how he got there. Another said they were waiting in a pharmacy, but that no one said anything and he just passed by, confused and talking to himself. They said they watched, with their own eyes, as he ignored a person of the non-junkie variety when that good Samaritan tried to help him at the pharmacy. Of course, plenty more of the stories were clearly bullshit. Sometimes stuff they probably heard through the junkie grapevine, like him being a cop or a member of some organized crime group or another. Sometimes they were just junkies talking in the moment and didn't mean anything. But there were other stories too. People were prone to going missing, and it's hard to tell which stories were just explanations for overdoses and which ones were genuinely weird shit. And I kept hearing that we should all stay away from the beaches and the parks, especially in the mornings. A lot of people who tried to sleep there overnight on the trip down to Florida simply don't make it. Even the large groups, who occasionally had their own armed hicks for security, were prone to avoiding the living shit out of the coast and driving inland, even though it was covered in police. The Everglades is a place no one would cross, and the fact that there were almost no junky outlets in areas along the most rural southern part of the west coast, or at least fewer of them, was taken as proof that all junkies should avoid it. This made me worried since I live on the edge of an area called Loxahatchee, all the way across the county from the Grand Island and pretty much bordering the massive wetlands covering Florida. Miami was loudly and openly known as its opposite, and it was known for being absolutely safe for even the most absurd behavior. I kept hearing relatively consistent stories about strange people who had warned junkies about police and, in at least one seemingly less batshit story, even distracting the police. They wore weird clothes and smiled great big smiles, even though I kept hearing that they didn't look happy. Despite being helpful, people were generally scared shitless of them and they kept repeating that stuff about the mirthless smiles. One of the most infamous legends was to avoid the tourist traps and fields along the lines of the Blue Highway, I-95 for the uninitiated. Over and over I would hear about how people would pull off the main highway into largely uninhabited areas that compose the majority of Florida and seem relatively safe. Over and over, I heard about people going missing that way. I remembered hearing about this from other junkies before, but how many times? I never paid attention to these urban legends, but now they were suddenly becoming crucial in my mind. I wondered how many of them were true or even just half-truths. The most frequently repeated junkie legends involved people or things coming out of the woods and leaving little of whoever they found. It was always a friend who disappeared as part of a larger group or something else distant. I noticed that people hated talking about it more than anything. I also noticed that there were no stories of single people being killed or going missing. It was always entire groups, and some exits were worse than others. A guy named Damon, pretty sure he picked that name for his fake license, had been coming around for as long as I knew and was pretty friendly with Debbie and Dave, and had name-dropped George on more than one occasion. He came in just after Samantha disappeared, wearing his usual Stone Temple pilot shirt and black denim jeans, but seemingly almost impressive for his relative level of hygiene and the quality of the clothing and car he owned. After he checked in and was waiting in the doctor's hall, I decided to start a conversation. Good morning, Mr. Damon. Would you uh, mind if I asked you a question? It's a free country, ain't it? He smiled kindly from behind unreflective aviator sunglasses. If I were driving along I-95 and I needed to stop and rest, say, off Yeehaw Junction an area about 30 miles away from bumfuck nowhere. Where can I stop at? He stopped smiling. 
I'd say skip an exit or two and forget whatever you thought needed at Yeehaw Junction. Even when we go to Lake Wales, we drive around the long way. Lake Wales was a major crystal meth production center at the time, and it was closed to rural spots like Winterhaven and Eustace, attracting its own narcosphere of interconnected supply workers and distributors quickly. He meant driving down the other coast, an entirely different group of operations I had no knowledge of. For so many scumbags to avoid, such an obvious shortcut wasn't just unusual, it was borderline impossible. I had driven through there and slept in parking lots as a teenager all the time, with nothing to worry about. Why do that? He looked exasperated. Less heartache. He clapped his hands to his knees and shrugged to show his lack of enthusiasm for the subject. I nodded and moved on. Eventually, Debbie asked me why I bothered Damon about it. She was gorgeous. With dark brown hair, a kind of Native American look, and a dislike for being hit on or being told to smile. She often dressed in the frumpier version of her wardrobe and didn't care what the patients or I thought about her appearance. When she wanted to look great, it was easy. But right now, with slightly smeared eye makeup, she looked angrier than she was. Wilkes, I need you to tell me what you were talking to Damon about. George texted me about it. This was actually a big deal since George was the real power, and despite sleeping in the same bed as him, we almost never heard about his wishes. I wanted to ask him about places to sleep along I-95. She stared at me with a hint of accusation. Why? I keep hearing patients talk about this spot I used to camp in when I was younger, like there's a, something wrong with it. She sighed and thought about it for a second. I stared at her knowing that she had some idea as to what the fuck was going on, or at least what the scale of the shit was. She glanced at the ground before meeting my eyes again. You need to stop asking people about it. It scares them and they might start to think bad stuff if they think you've been going there. She stared at me defiantly, but I was suddenly in no mood to concretely find out what she knew. What she knew was that the place was clearly dangerous. I took this to meaning that it was widely known enough to just stay away from. Looking back on all of this, I probably should have. That afternoon before I left a little girl who came in with what appeared to be her mother and father bounded up to me. She was wearing a little blue shirt and white pants and seemed delighted to talk to someone after having to stay quiet to avoid the junkies for so many hours. Hello. Me and my mommy and my daddy are coming down here and we tried to sleep off Yeehaw Junction, but a man in a blue alligator mask ran up to us and yelled at us twice and bit the front of our car. You shouldn't go there. I was more than a bit stunned and she just happily bounded off away. We were standing outside the clinic and she ran to her dad, an old man with a stained trucker hat and a gray t-shirt, who didn't look like he enjoyed the people who normally came to our clinic. He nodded to me and walked off to their car, which was missing the front bumper and had a spare tire. Jesus fucking Christ. So if this was entirely caused by supernatural shit, there is no way I'm the only one who noticed. I stared at their car as it limped away, for once hoping they got good money for their meds. Patients overdosing became so common that the phone calls from police demanding information on the amount of medication prescribed to the deceased stopped registering pretty quickly. It wasn't long until someone that I genuinely knew ended up being the reason for one of those calls. Corey Franks was found today in a ditch off a southern well past 441, dead from an overdose. We're going to need all the information you have on him. The detective was blunt fully aware that she was talking to one of the people who had helped expedite this young man's death. He was a 22-year-old surfer local. Locals were rare, and a friend of a friend. He was definitely an idiot. One of those people who listened to a lot of Sublime and talked about how it resonated with him whenever he got high. He hung out with me a couple of times, especially if I had weed and was usually full of shit and hung out only with people who were generally pretty awful even by white trash standards. 
A lot of his friends genuinely thought insane clown posse and role-playing games where you dressed up as a vampire in public and really acted it out were entirely acceptable. Whoever he was with may have been the one who left the poor kid's body in a canal near the Loxahatchee Glades. Didn't even take the medication. It was all there. We're trying to find any information on any close relatives or anyone who won't hang up if we call about him. She was saying a lot more than they normally did. I wondered if she knew that I knew Corey, or if she just sensed that she could strike a chord with me. A sudden feeling of terror ripped through me, turning me cold as ice. I didn't so much think about what prison would be like as much as feel it, as if it were waiting around a corner for me. I don't know. I stammered while looking at his file on my computer. The cheap plastic desk suddenly felt ice cold, and I was all too aware that the DEA was probably watching my every move. This phone call could very well end up in my trial. The feeling of eyes on my back made my skin crawl. I talked to him a few times, but he didn't list any contacts, and he mentioned that his dad kicked him out a year ago. I knew he had been staying with a bunch of junkies from South Carolina who took him with them to pick up and sell their medication at a profit, and I began to search my mind for the words to use to summarize this. He was staying in a motel for an extended period, and we had the license plates and names of the people he seemed to be staying with. Would you mind checking if they are patients too? I already knew that at least one of the two names would show up. The ringleaders who owned the cars and fronted everyone else the cash for their visits rarely stayed as patients themselves. I had no interest in exerting any energy in protecting them and happily faxed her all the relevant files without telling anyone. The rest of the day went by quickly thanks to a lot of pipettes in the bathroom and doxlamine. I said goodnight to Debbie and Jessica as the doctors filed out to their luxury cars. The moment I opened the deeply tinted glass storefront, the feeling of eyes watching me was almost physically palpable. The sun was down, and the parking lot empty aside from some homeless gathering in front of some empty storefronts. I whipped around and in the dark I saw a beaten to hell 90s Buick Roadmaster station wagon. I remember it clearly because it was the one quarry used to drive. He thought it was the coolest thing in the world because he read on a website that station wagons were cool, and it had a V8. The headlights weren't on, despite the sun being only a dark orange slit. It seemed to move towards me, but if it was, it was much slower than I could easily gauge, especially in the dark. I didn't hear the threatening burble of the engine, but I got the impression it was moving towards me. I had no idea why Corey's junky friends would swing by this place after he died, and I didn't want to find out. I avoided making eye contact with the vehicle's front windshield and opened my car door without bothering to see if the movement I saw in the reflection on the windshield was something actually behind me. By the time I got back to my shitty one-bedroom house, this happens in Florida, in the middle of Loxahatchee, it was pitch dark and the swamp was emitting its usual deep, guttural sounds. I put on some romantic comedy that made me feel good once. I tried to envision myself as one of the characters of the movie, happy and normal. But at this point, I was just trying to remember the last time I had successfully escaped to that degree. That night, I got more fucked up than usual. I desperately chugged the remainder of a 750 of dirt cheap vodka. I remembered buying the expensive stuff and telling myself that I'd make it last, but I had stopped telling myself excuses a while ago. I followed this with some Xanax and a little NyQuil. I put on some headphones. I tried to either get into the music or the movie, but no amount of weed could let me escape reality. I went to sleep with the TV on mute in a desperate attempt to let some of the positive emotions from that saccharine movie soak into me. I woke, covered in cold sweat, gasping for air. It was still dark out and colder than usual for Florida thanks to some exceptional December winds. Despite the money I was bringing in, the only piece of furniture in my room was a mattress and a box spring on the floor and a desk and a chair for my PC. 
I was desperately craving the sweet burn of booze, despite feeling deeply nauseous. If I had to guess, I was probably still drunk. I got up in the start and saw something move in the dark near my door. I squinted in the dark and suddenly I heard my front door open. I ran out of my room in my underwear only to see my front door wide open in the beaten Buick on the road that ran perpendicular to my small driveway. It was facing me, as if it was about to drive directly into my front door. Sitting across the road attached to my house. My home, like most in rural Florida, was hemmed in by plant life. This combined with the flat land ensured that you usually only see a wall of green or shitty strip malls when you drive anywhere in the state. The car was sitting on the road, facing my house directly, blocking the road entirely. It was the only object in my field of vision other than woods and road. The lights still weren't on, and once again I got the impression the car was moving. I could feel something watching me and a sudden feeling of terror froze my spine. This time entirely without any connotations of the FBI or jail. Whatever was inside of that car was watching me. I saw something move in the air in between the car and me, but couldn't make out what it was. I flipped on the light switch nearest to me and didn't bother looking to see if it revealed anything. I slammed the door shut and ran through the tiny concrete shack I called home, flipping on every light and turning on the TV to full blast, as if the sound of people laughing and falling in love in that movie would somehow ward anything off. I didn't dare look directly at any window, instead catching them from the corner of my sight to make sure the blinds were already pulled shut. I staggered into the kitchen, still fucked up apparently, and pulled a Red Bull from my fridge. The sharp taste did refresh me for a brief second. I wanted to get out of there, but I would not dare go near the door in case something wanted to come back inside. I sat down on my couch with my back to the concrete wall. My cell phone had a missed call from my friend Carl who called at 1.30. It was 3.37 at that point. I called him praying to God he wanted drugs badly enough to drive to my place right away. He didn't, but I offered some free Xanax and I could hear him putting on clothes before he ended the 16-second phone call in a confused tone. I didn't move until the doorbell rang, when I just said loudly, Come in! I was terrified it wasn't going to be Carl. Carl looked exhausted even for a junkie, but smiled weakly with an interested look in his eyes. I was more than happy to open my private stock, hoping to God he would try and strike up a conversation in an effort to get more drugs. I showed him the giant bottle of Soma pills I had pilfered, and he brightened right up. That that does sound good. I got horrible back spasms and lack. Yeah... I was already pouring some out for him before he finished the excuse for his addiction and he seemed too happy to question it. Hey, uh, do you have some new neighbors or something? He asked absent-mindedly as he popped a few of the Soma. I blinked hard and tried to shake off the fear that was still with me, or at least keep it from showing. No, uh, no, why did you, did you see someone? I tried and failed. He seemed to notice but kept going. Yeah, when I drove up here, there was someone standing in the road staring at your house. It looked like their car had broken down because they were standing outside of it. I tried to talk to them, but they just drove off. Them wasn't the word I wanted to hear about right now. He seemed to think maybe my new neighbor was just nuts because he was smirking. Are they gone? I was pretty openly fucking terrified at this point and Carl seemed to become concerned. Yeah, I only saw one person for a split second and I'm pretty sure there was someone else inside. They must have run off. Do you think it was the cops or someone following you? Uh, you could crash at my place. My, um, my mom wouldn't care. He tapered as he was speaking and I guess that maybe he was just offering concern as thanks for the free drugs but I had to take it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that would be cool. I could sneak out before she woke up anyways. Carl's mom was 67 and suffering from a laundry list of medical issues. She took care of Carl as if he was a perpetually wounded bird, no matter how many times he stole from her. She was barely hanging on to a job where she had been quietly demoted repeatedly and offered various severance packages to retire, but she had no savings thanks to Carl and couldn't dream of it. She was perpetually nervous and drank a lot of wine, and I hated seeing her because of the guilt I felt for giving this asshole drugs. I swallowed this and followed Carl out to his car, massively relieved to not see the Buick out there. I slept like a baby on his couch for almost three hours before whatever was in me wore off and I woke up and drove to my place for a shower. Work went by, but not easily. I told Debbie that the car had been following me and that it had been a friend of mine's who had OD'd. She listened intently, and when I left her office, I heard her speaking into her cell phone with a concerned tone. Aside from the typical junkie business, it was a normal day, with the normal amount of terrible shit. Not a single human being wanted to be there, and most were disgusted with themselves for showing up. People spat chewing tobacco into bottles of Mountain Dew and left them there. They got into fistfights over drugs in the parking lot, and a couple of girls who looked like they were ready to kill themselves waited outside near the parking lot in outfits of varying degrees of skimpiness, willing to turn tricks for pills. Eventually, I decided to finally stop procrastinating and confront Debbie. She was in her office and told me to come in when I knocked. She had an array of drugs in front of her and a laptop with a spreadsheet open. Hey, I have to talk to you. Some shit happened on that island at that drop, and some other shit. She sighed and shut her laptop. She had clearly hoped I would dump this one on someone else's plate. I know, shit went bad. She turned around to face me and motioned for me to sit in a chair across from her desk. Listen, we got the bags, alright? You did good. Someone was trying to fuck with you. I haven't even said what happened yet, and I'm pretty sure it was not people who have been fucking with me. I sank into the chair and stared at my knees while I prepared for either bullshit or something worse. I don't know what was more amazing, that she thought this was just weird people, or that they sent someone to pick up the bags later. I was genuinely worried the bags were just filled with newspaper and they didn't plan on me coming back at all. A lot of weird people are involved in this shit. They do anything to get more. We had to make the drop there, but we thought it wasn't likely for anyone to notice you since you're kinda new. It usually takes people a while before the weirdos notice you. Well, this opened up a lot of questions and no answers. I was already frustrated. Why did you have to make the drop there? That doesn't make sense, and why were there weirdos? And by the way, that is not what they were. I found myself deeply unwilling to state that rotting bird demons may have been at fault, as if saying it out loud would make all the weird shit true. As long as there was the possibility that I was mistaken, there was the possibility that it was just junkies and thieves the whole time. There is some shit going on around here that belongs in the X-Files and I have the bird feathers to prove it. She had a deeply unsettled look and she stared down at her desk as if reading something for a moment. We had to make the drop there. We didn't have a choice. Look, I'm going to talk to Dave when he gets back. Do you, do you want to crash at me and George's place for the time being? If you don't feel safe, that is. She sounded sincere and a little guilty. This was good, but the idea of sleeping in the same house as her mobster boyfriend with swastika tattoos just didn't seem as reassuring as a shitty motel room or a friend in City Place. The tiny cluster of expensive restaurants in the middle of what was once a massive ghetto. I did not want her to extend that offer any more than she already did, as the thought of being in her home was more than a little disturbing. I'm alright. For right now, I'm... I'm going to crash at a room at Simon's or a motel. I muttered a thanks and goodbye and went back to work. 
It was less than a week to Christmas and the patients were as demanding as ever. My friend Simon wasn't excited about putting me up, so I said no worries and decided to head to a La Quinta nearby that, thankfully, had a filled parking lot. Without being in my home and not giving a shit even if there was a car outside or a bird on the roof because there were cameras and other people and somehow I didn't think any of the weird shit would be too courageous, I finally slept deeply and without too many drugs. Aside from some dream, where I was looking for a mask in an old station wagon, I slept like a baby. Chapter 4 The following days were right before Christmas and I really had no interest in going back to my place, even for clothes. I called Debbie and let her know I'd be a little late and then texted Carl to see if he could check up on my place. Both said something along the lines of, no problem, and I went shopping for clothes at the nearest Marshalls. I hadn't forgotten that when you're not locked in a dungeon that would make Charlie Sheen feel uncomfortable due to the amount of substance abuse, West Palm Beach is actually a genuinely nice place to live. During the winter, the humidity and temperature both drop and it becomes increasingly difficult not to enjoy the brisker weather. I took advantage of this and the extra time and decided to get a few relatively nice things from the discount bin of the biggest marshals in town before heading back to the motel room to shower and get changed. I wanted to do something other than wonder to what degree the bird monster and whatever was driving that car were related to the other creepy shit. It was probably the first day I hadn't tried to push it with Xanax because I can remember it clearly without going to my journal. I didn't want to think about the drug dealers, hookers, the smell of urine, feces, and human rot that pervaded the clinic with a constant look of misery on every single person's face. I stood outside of the motel as the sun was just finishing its rise against the pit in my stomach that remained from Dave telling me it was the worst time of day to go outside. I kept an eye out for birds. The sky was an explosion of turquoise with ribbons of violent pink and orange and reflective clouds that looked impossibly bright. This is a pretty typical Florida morning, especially in winter. It looked like a trapper keeper from the 90s. Three hours later, the way the cashier at Marshall smiled with genuine looking happiness before going back to a conversation with a co-worker shook me to the bone, like a cold shower after a bender. At about nine in the morning, the sky was bright blue, but still shot through with a handful of scintillating neon tangerine bolts left over from sunrise. One of the upsides to living in a flat place that rarely gives a hint that anything beyond tree level could exist is that riding over different parts of town could be an absolute thrill, especially with your windows rolled down, or if you are lucky enough to own a convertible or motorcycle, enjoying the full throttle of the elements. Dave had sent a single text, asking me to meet him at Dubois Park in Jupiter. I didn't feel great about this since it was along the water, but the thought that he at least knew something of what was going on and the fact that it was at 10.30 when families would be there was reassuring. I stopped at the Paris Cafe near Clematis Street and treated myself to a chocolate brio something or other. The streets around Clematis were much more developed than South Florida's norm, and sported the closest things to skyscrapers West Palm Beach had. After this small area, it shot down instantly to single-story buildings and homes. The Trump Towers bedecked sections of downtown, where ghettos filled with black people who had no hope left for better jobs or medical care sat next to cafes designed with yuppies in mind. The library was at the end of this street during the time, facing the waterfront with a massive glass window that was relatively gorgeous as far as public buildings in Florida go. At nighttime, the area is usually a slow, stunning show of neon pinks, oranges, blues, and purples set amid a sea of jet black from the signs of bars and other nighttime establishments. 
At daytime, it's a classy affair with small trees planted every now and then in between the beige to light pastel buildings with wealthy white people walking their dogs in between. No more than 20 minutes walking, the nice streets, or five minutes driving, right past the city place outdoor mall, and you would arrive at a place that would redefine how you viewed the words poor and destitute. After a few minutes driving over the only man-made hills in Palm Beach County, I turned around to the nearby Okeechobee Boulevard, which bookended the nicer part of City Place and drove to Military Trail where I drove north through suburbia for about an hour, skipping I-95 to enjoy the long way through South Florida. By the time I got to Dubois, it was 12.30 and I was right on time. Dave was waiting in a salmon pink Cuban style linen shirt and black pants outside of the parking lot nearest the beach. There was a more secluded one inland near a massive brackish river, but I wasn't going to argue with having families playing in sight. He stood aside a matte black Mercedes AMG something or other with his arms crossed, smiling towards the sea. He almost looked like a particularly peaceful supervillain. He motioned to a nearby picnic table within view of both the families and a massive rock seawall that allowed a powerful man-made river that ran the sea to inland water sources. The park itself was a historical one that was built on a midden used by the Jaiga people who lived here before the Seminoles of whites who came after. Aside from some old homes built over a hundred years ago, there were a variety of archaeological sites of interest to anyone who wanted to look at rocks some natives used. Apparently, due to the lack of load-bearing animals, they had a tendency to live near large bodies of water, even when the water wasn't fresh, as it made travel and carrying baskets filled with goods easier. The traces of the buildings they made before being enslaved by Spaniards and taken to Cuba were found at some point during the 80s. It was a popular and beautiful park hillier than you'd expect Florida to be. The sight of other people and the thought that he probably wouldn't be friends with whatever I saw before reassured me enough to take a seat next to where he had a few joints and a sandwich and a coffee from Havana's Palm Beach's most popular Cuban restaurant. He smiled slightly and unapologetically. All right, let's clear the air. He clasped his massive hands together in a V over his breakfast. First, I'm going to need you to hand me your cell phone. This was a common but mildly threatening practice. I'm not sure what good it would have done had the cops actually been watching. I handed both cell phones I owned to him, and he took this and put them in the trunk of his car for the time being. I know. I have no idea what possible good that would do even if I was an informant, but I assumed it was mainly for the show. These guys weren't bright. When he sat back down, he looked particularly relaxed as he motioned for me to speak while he dug into what looked like a media noche, a pressed ham sandwich on egg bread similar to Hala. All right, listen, I've had a rough time with this. No one told me what was waiting for me at the drop, and they haven't exactly left me alone. I need to know what's going on. I said this in an apologetic tone that surprised me, but the size of the muscles on this guy as well as his gun reminded me to be polite. Also, the fact that I would run out of pills within a week put more than a little pressure on me. He lit up a joint before replying and took a long drag before exhaling and placing the joint on the table next to his sandwich. You've done... great. We're all really surprised. You took this really well. I'm going to tell you what we know of this shit. But first, just say that we had to make the drop there because the police wouldn't go near it either, and it was the only place we could have gotten away with it. We thought you would have had an easier time getting in and out, but I'm glad you made it out safe and we'll know better than to throw you out like that next time. Despite an absolutely reassuring tone, I could not have been more horrified. He knew something was there, and the cops were prone to avoiding it as well. 
I had to wonder if the well-dressed man would be able to interact with police the same way he did with junkies. Were there old ladies who just called the police three times a week about the bird demons terrorizing their teacup Yorkie without getting a response? Did the young men's choir at Palm Beach Atlantic just learn to schedule their beachside concerts around possible swooping attacks? What were those fucking things? This time I spoke without any reluctance. Now that he had acknowledged the frightening part of this, I didn't hold back. We don't know. That's the honest truth of it, man. The people who told us about them used to be with the cocaine cowboys of the 70s, would drop packages of blow in the Everglades by prop plane. Apparently, they ran into a lot of problems. What about the car? This time, he looked at me as if I might not be serious. A little while ago, a friend of mine died. Now his car has been showing up without the engine on. Stalking me. Wilkes, you need to listen to me. We've never heard anyone complain about a car. We've heard a lot of spooky shit, and keep in mind to not ask anyone about traveling near Yee Hole Junction again. But driverless cars just haven't been on the list. Maybe one of your rigmates have the car and just put quieter mufflers on it. Are you sure it wasn't a junkie? I, I hate to break it to you, but they might start wondering what you're keeping at home. You should consider buying a gun. Well, one way or the other. It seemed a bit absurd that he thought I was being ridiculous for worrying about the car after being attacked by bird creatures. A slight hint of a Boston accent came out when he pronounced car as car. I was instantly relieved that at least that seemed, to him, to not be supernatural, and desperately wanted to believe that it was just a B and e from some guy while I was wasted. After having it confirmed that those may, in fact, have been something non-human attacking my car, it would be nice to have a human source of fear again. He put his sandwich down, finished a chew, and followed up with the coffee you could smell from a block away. Why don't you tell me what files to pull that came with your friend, and I'll find out if one of them has been seen driving the car. I described the Buick while he texted the information to some unknown, colorful wad of muscle. He resumed talking while he did it. So, we've heard about the other shit, though bird people, right? We heard them call sticking in here something before, and at least that's one some pillbillies call them. But we don't know what they are. We just know to avoid them. Just like anything else weird we encounter. We're drug dealers. Not whatever bureau gets assigned to shit like this. What I can tell you is simple. Stay away from the beaches during the morning. If something takes an interest in you, avoid anyone else and stay indoors for as long as you can. We've heard of people getting tricked by these things using other people's voices, but never during broad daylight. Always at night, or in the early morning, but usually the morning. He said this seriously but with the attention someone would give a list they had read out loud too many times before. What about the guy with the stupid tie? He left something at the clinic after he came. He nodded solemnly at me. I know, Wilkes. And you're doing damn good by keeping quiet through all this. We don't know who or what that guy is, but he showed up at other clinics before and he's been known to go through clinics in an area. Whenever he shows up at one, he'll be nearby later. Maybe at a motel where groups are staying or something like that. But he always moves from area to area. I told you as soon as I could after he left the American Injury Clinic. It may take a while, but he always comes around. Other than that, I've only heard stories, but... Those stories come from as far away as Oregon, where the European kindred were apparently looking for him. The European kindred are a group of racists loosely connected to the Aryan Brotherhood known for haunting the poorer and more ignorant parts of Northern California, 
to Washington and Idaho. They were just as frequently known for violence, and if I remember, they were prominently featured in a horror movie recently. Something they are probably proud of. The distance that guy seemed to be able to cover was something to be worried about. And if a group connected to the AB couldn't put a bounty on the guy, it probably wasn't much use trying to get to the bottom of him myself. Does he have a name? Lloyd? Or maybe Lyle or something? He looked at me with a look of patience being expanded. If someone asks him his name, they're probably so fucked it's not worth worrying about. At least, that's what I've been led to believe. You're better off having a conversation with the DEA as far as getting dead goes. He happily went back to his sandwich. I didn't know what else to ask without accusing him of lying and knowing more than he was claiming. He seemed to enjoy the silence when I sat and thought about this. I can't tell you how much of this is junky talk and how much of it is real. Like those fucking birds. What I can tell you is that if a bunch of organized crime groups and drug dealers all start avoiding something, you should too. I've heard tons of crap that turned out to be just crap. These people, loaded most of the time anyways. But it's not like anyone has ever taken the time to explain this shit to us. We're just hearing about it while we try to make money. You know? This didn't answer why I had to make that drop, and I became increasingly aware of the fact that he sent me out knowing there was danger, and wasn't telling me why that place was necessary. Once he resorted to the old, they're just junkies who don't know what they're talking about, bit, I knew he was done talking. Talking honestly, at least. I kept repeating the words stick and ninny in my head, over and over. I was hoping it meant something and wasn't just typical Hicks slang. I took a few bites of my croissant from my favorite cafe and pretended that I was put at ease over his comfort with the supernatural. I took a joint and lit up myself, and sure enough, it was a good one. I took a moment to fantasize that if I ever got arrested, it would be worth it for me to snitch just to ask what the cops knew during the proffer. That is, the meeting with the prosecuting attorney where you trade knowledge of other people's crimes for your own freedom. For the time being, I desperately tried to play it cool. Okay, well, cool. There was a high-pitched squeak somewhere in there that made him smirk and raise an eyebrow. But other than that, he seemed to ignore it not happily before wolfing down his sandwich. For a moment... I wondered if they would have rolled over on it had I been ripped apart by said bird things. If the cops already knew, but didn't put a patrol car out with a guy in some bird shot, it probably wouldn't do any good to do anything else. We made some small chat where I told him a story about an old lady pretending to be crippled to get more meds and then dropping her crutches and running like hell when someone got too close to her bag that was left in the waiting room. He had a great one about a guy with swastika tattoos everywhere, complaining that the black doctor was racist against him for not prescribing more than normal despite a clearly badly cut finger. Then, of course, he asked me if we were cool. I couldn't say no to more drugs, and I meant that in a very literal way. It wasn't really an option. This made me hate him even more. He reminded me of the clinic and I'd rather emasculate myself with broken glass than have an extended conversation with him. But you do a lot of weird, horrible shit for drugs. I got out of there and texted Debbie that I'd need the rest of the day, which she didn't object to. Carl had tried to call me twice. I began heading back to my shack after listening to the message Carl left saying that my door had been flung open and much of my possessions were lying out in my front lawn. He also said that he had just gotten out of the hospital for a little thing and that he had taken too many pills. I wondered, albeit briefly, how much stress this put on his poor mother. 
It was his third time with an overdose this year, and it was right before Christmas. It was a miracle he kept surviving. If I had neighbors who had to drive by my place, this may have been a problem. When I got there, my hackles began to rise immediately. It took a few moments after the long 55-minute drive from Jupiter to my place to stretch and carefully look up and down my road for any signs of a sneaking Buick or bird feathers. I didn't see them on the road or the way to my front door, but noticed the telltale signs of junkies after that. The crushed Mountain Dew can was lying on my pathway. Someone had pissed and shat all over my bed and there was chewing tobacco on my couch. My TV had been stolen. Anything else was scattered or destroyed, including three windows. I couldn't be happier. If this meant that Dave was right and that was just a breaking and entering I experienced while wasted, that may have been the greatest news of my life. I cleaned up to the best of my ability, threw away my bed, and got high as fuck on my reclining chair, which only had a couple cigarettes put out on it. I had taken my drugs with me, and they probably weren't happy at leaving empty-handed. I snickered at the thought of Dave's goons finding out who they were and fucking them up and mildly regretting not being able to call the police. Still, the drugs were worth more than everything in the house, and they didn't touch them. I googled Florida's gun buying process on my phone and texted Carl back that everything was under control and that I wouldn't mind hooking them up later as the pills I ate were slowly absorbed. I rarely went for the quick high and preferred the slow moving lurch of the pills when they were taken orally. And Roxycodone and Xanax both had excellent oral bioavailability rates. First I got a relatively cheap new computer. It was nice to see a normal retail store and I enjoyed wasting the associate's time watching the high school kid upsell me eventually to something that could play a video game or two. I didn't have the heart to tell him why I didn't want to open a credit account and needed to pay for it in cash. Then went to a shooting range and got a small booklet I needed on gun safety and gun laws before heading home for some googling. I absentmindedly left a message for my landlord about the broken windows knowing that he would certainly force me to pay for it anyways and that I should probably call it Glass Place. After arriving at my now much more drafty and urine-scented home, I plugged my new rig in and started the long boot process. Instead of looking up glass, though, I decided to find out what a stickin' is. Needless to say, stickin' any didn't bring anything up and neither did a combination of that and bird or monster. When you Google things like this, you usually end up wading through websites made by New Agers who seem to compensate for their lack of knowledge with enthusiasm and shitty backgrounds, but eventually you might get the rough edges of an idea. It didn't take me long, however, to find out that many Seminole believed in a sorcerer called Stegini that often took the shape of an owl. Apparently, it was believed to be a shapeshifter with the ability to take an owl-like form that it then used to hunt humans. Unfortunately, I only found a single webpage that seemed legitimate. Most of the rest was New Age crap and bad illustrations. The First Nations Heritage Database covers Native American legends from every corner of the continent. Even this site was pretty slim, however, and described it as a myth that seems to have originated with either the Ais or the Jaga once populated the land north of Miami all the way to Orlando long before Europeans arrived. However, while later collections of mythology from other Native American nations had plenty of wildly different stories, there was almost no information about what the original Ais or Jaga believed. All of the different legends believed that a person had to be inducted into the Stegini. It required the person to be disemboweled, but they then gained any number of different abilities to terrify mortals. Most agreed that they ate the organs of mortals in order to absorb their life force, kind of like a vampire. While they looked like normal humans most of the time, they could vomit up the intestines of the last person they devoured and hide them to take the form of a giant owl and go hunting. 
If they were friendly, they would alert natives to illness in a village and would become considered an omen of death for the elderly and ill. However, most of the legends imply that they were inherently unfriendly. The only helpful information was that if their innards were destroyed while they were in their owl form, they would be killed. Even the myths mentioned that Stegini hid these because of this. They also kept apprentices who were given masks with powers that allowed them to work on the Stegini's behalf. I quickly wrote a couple of emails to the website and to another group of Facebook that apparently focuses on Native American stories from Florida specifically, but tried to make it seem like I wasn't fishing for information on how to deal with them in real life. Then I called my landlord and got yelled at for a few minutes over the windows, which I claimed were in perfectly good shape when I left my home for work one day, before securing a cheap new bed to be delivered via Craigslist. The word Stegini kept repeating in my mind, like a catchy tune I couldn't get out of my head. After the bed came, and I found a lamppost that looked like it could vaguely defend me against an unarmed hobo, I got ready for an early night of drug use and romantic comedies blaring at high volume. I didn't want to sleep there and was suddenly more aware than ever that the drug dealers who tore my place apart would be more than willing to beat the shit out of me or kill me for drugs but we don't always get to choose. It occurred to me that in light of recent information, it was very likely that Corey was given a hot dose, or a small but deadly amount of fentanyl or something mixed with his normal junk. It was a common way of getting rid of unwanted junkies when a dealer needed things to calm down, and there was no telling how many overdoses were actual murders. The police never investigated anyways. Hours later before nodding off. I would wonder if Corey Franks told them something that would make me seem like a particularly good target before either they or his own prescription killed him. The next day went by with the usual amount of urine and fighting. Debbie called me into our office towards 11 to let me know I could go home early and pass on a message. George wants me to tell you something important. She said that in a calm but severe manner. As the head of the operation, I had never been in the same room as him. It was important to make sure only certain people interacted with us so that the FBI didn't have photographs of the entire group working together, because that would make a RICO case a cakewalk. Getting a text or phone call from him would be unheard of. Being asked to meet him in person was like getting to meet a celebrity you never wanted to meet and being expected to pretend to be interested in everything they say. George had an incredible level of control over me simply because I didn't want him to think he needed to correspond with me any further. Alrighty. You need to think about whether or not someone has gotten angry with you lately. Is this about the car? I cut her off almost right away. For a moment, I hoped this related to the car whose occupants may or may not have been junkies who broke into my place. No, Wilkes. You need to think. Who or whatever attacked you has a reason for it. We don't know why they pick people, but it's not always random, we think. This is serious. Sometimes they come back, but we don't know what they can or can't do. She said this in a tone that was almost angry. I'd heard her use it before when she needed me to do something serious, usually involving instructions on avoiding law enforcement. Dave is looking into the car you told him about. You should have mentioned something sooner. Whoever is doing that may be behind everything else. He thinks it might be someone named Teddy Rance, the guy who used to ringlead for your friend's group. There's a good chance he's at the Castle Inn near Palm Beach Lakes tonight. His friends just stopped by American Injury. She began to rattle off details of the group that traveled with Corey Franks. The group was now probably being closely watched by authorities thanks to my giving them all the information possible on them and essentially fingering them in his death. You need to crash at my place tonight. You'll be as safe as it gets there. Sleeping in the house of a notorious crime boss normally doesn't sound like a good idea, and I hustled fast for a way out of it. I couldn't find one. At about 5.30, I ended up meeting Debbie at her place. One of the doctors had me stay later than normal to help organize some Roxy Codo, and he had to sign over to another doctor to hide the fact that they were missing thousands of pills. 
It was located in Wellington, a remote but relatively wealthy area known for cookie-cutter McMansions and large gated communities. The gate, as well as the cameras, drastically increased my confidence that this may have actually been a good idea. The memory of the sheer amount of firepower kept in the house also helped. The development was owned by another company of his, and while most of the houses were still being worked on, the one he lived in as well as the few next to it were finished in incredible detail. The house itself was four floors and looked much like the other massive houses in the neighborhood. With a massive pool and lagoon in the backyard to boot, it had massive sharp angles for a roof. A single second floor window looked out over the front door, almost looking like a cyclops. Large windows were interspaced with thin, vertical windows that looked like the windows in an old castle tower. Debbie's BMW M6 sat in the driveway next, dwarfed by George's outrageous Ford pickup truck, which appeared to me to be the approximate size of a semi-truck outside of a five-car garage that I knew was filled with a variety of vehicles. The home had cathedral ceilings and marble floors that made the entrance foyer look bigger than my home may have been. The furniture was all black leather, with dark walnut wood for cabinets but mostly black and steel. It looked like the interior of a sports car, but endless, with a huge room that drifted between spaces used for a kitchen and what could have been five living rooms, all overlooking the beautiful lagoon. The only sore spot was the unfinished jacuzzi, which was being built in a large man-made hill overlooking the rest. Its metal was still visible, gleaming at night, and the waterfall running from it into the lagoon was not yet flowing. George himself sat on the sofa. It would be impossible to miss him. He was wearing a black tank top and black sweatpants that revealed his Winsterall-enhanced muscles and his gigantic swastika tattoo on his arm. He had a flat top that made him look like a slightly graying... He was in his early 30s, but had a couple of streaks and didn't hide them. Criminal version of a marine. Two skinheads with tattoos on their faces flanked him silently, who I would later discover were Steve and Kyle. One had only a small line of teardrops, while the other had his entire neck and arms entirely covered in addition to teardrops, a swastika between his eyes, and a quote along the line of his ear. This was Kyle and I had heard about him before. Both wore an almost uniform pair of black dicky shorts and white t-shirts that I had seen on some Floridian skinheads before. George nodded to me when I came in and motioned for me to sit on his couch with Debbie and him as they watched Duck Dynasty without saying anything. In between commercials, he bounced off of his couch to me, smiled charmingly, and shook my hand. George... Wilkes. We introduced ourselves with our names alone, but he warmed up after Duck Dynasty was over. So, what happened? He asked this casually while preparing a meal that he seemed to be focused on controlling down to the calorie. Are you hungry? I told him I was and filled him in on what happened at the dead drop. He listened silently while I rambled on about Corey Franks, the birds, the guy in the bolo tie, everything. Debbie stared at us with a concerned and interested face. When I was done explaining it all the first time, so was the meal. Dinner was a single skinless, boneless chicken breast with a lot of greens and exactly a tablespoon and a half of dark brown rice. The fat man in me was horrified, and I plotted on eating two public subs to compensate for this. As I finished explaining the Samantha thing for the second time, he sighed and motioned for me to let him speak. I'm sorry you've had a rough run of it. There's something we've seen once or twice, but never as frequently as you're describing. We've only heard about them from people who had isolated encounters with them. You've seen them at least twice, and the first time was on your first day. I'm really hoping they aren't interested in you, specifically. Aside from what Dave told you, I'm afraid I don't really know anything else. We focus on police movements... Things that cause junkies to disappear or die a dozen and never get genuinely investigated. So aside from the Orr situation, nothing like this seems to have ever focused on us before. 
but yes, we do know about them. We were hoping they would ignore you because you're new. That seems to make a difference. He said this in the most erudite tone you could ever imagine. Polite and with excellent pronunciation. As he finished the painfully small meal, he nodded to Kyle. He began to count out a myriad small pills for himself for dessert. He was taking scoops, or GHB, which bodybuilders sometimes took for sleep and everyone else took to get fucked up. I was grateful that he had managed to somehow make me feel safe in this disaster and wasn't quite up for question and answer time. So I popped a few of the ones he had out, as well as my normal regimen of a shit ton of Xanax and just a little bit of Soma and Roxycodone. We went to the couch again and we all placed our feet in the massive coffee table that stood in front of the couch, with little spots especially for comfortable feet holsters. For a moment I imagined any European at all being offended at this custom design, but then I drifted into a rerun of The Walking Dead. I guess George and I didn't agree on what made for pleasant sleeping entertainment. I suppose taking a few days light did more good than I normally assumed it would, because I went right to sleep after that. I woke to the sound of their grand doorbell ringing. No, mm-hmm. I grunted at Debbie, but she was up and moving the moment the doorbell rang. She opened the door and smiled to whoever was outside of it before I heard a woman's voice beg for help and begin to vomit uncontrollably. Whoever was there managed to get Debbie to open the door without anyone else by her. I heard a female voice begging her again. Then I heard a sickening wet splash hit the concrete in front of her door. Debbie screamed. Oh, shit! At the sound of her raising her voice, whatever was left of the adrenaline in my body kicked into action. I tried to get off the oversized couch and look around, but everything was black and someone had thrown a blanket over me. I fell to the ground instantly and hit my head on the enormous coffee table. Shit, help! Debbie screamed to both me and George as I heard the front door fly open. I could see her turned, facing me while I heard George in the cavernous bedroom on the opposite side of the living room, a great distance away. It sounded like he was moving fast, whatever he was doing. She rushed out to help whoever it was while I was still stunned. Ahead of her, from the doorway, I saw very little light but a ribbon of red run from the ground in front of the door to the area where the light from outside could not reach. No. No, Debbie, no! I screamed at her while I got off of the ground and got to the door as quickly as possible. Every step seemed to take an eternity, and I heard sobbing and retching while I ran. And there was Carl's mother, Cynthia. The delicate old woman was wearing a pair of sweatpants and an old t-shirt and not her normal semi-formal attire, but I could recognize her. She was almost doubled over, but I could see her face clearly. It was craned upwards to the door. Blood and long ropes of viscera were pouring out of her mouth and onto the ground endlessly. Debbie was trying in vain to help her placing a hand on her back and telling me to come help or call an ambulance or something. She took a second look at Cynthia when she noticed the horrified look on my face. I don't remember what she was saying. Only the look on Cynthia's blood-covered face as she looked up at me and smiled. A long rope of gore was attached to some kind of roundish object that just made its way out of her mouth. Her entire body was impossibly thin except for her arms, which seemed to be bigger and flatter. The face had bloated until it was wide and round, her skin drained of color, becoming paler than cocaine, and her skull and hair seemed to rise in two sharp ridges above her eyes, which were now bloodshot and sickeningly wide. Debbie began to back away slowly, and then shouted for George before a horrible sound erupted from Cynthia's throat. You're killing my son. She pointed a long, shaking finger at me. Her voice was deep, warbling and growling at the same time. Cynthia retched more, 
and it seemed like the last pile of her intestines and other innards had collected at her feet. She stood up, suddenly strangely graceful, despite being covered in blood. Her eyes had grown massively wide, and her mouth had peeled open, exposing teeth that were now cracking as they fused together and became pointed. At this point, you would expect one of us to open fire or something. What you might not realize is that when you're faced with something supernatural, it's kind of like having your car break down entirely on the way to an important job interview. You open the hood and just stare at what you can't understand. You pray silently that you can find a way to stop it from killing you. We all stood silently in just that way for a moment. Debbie in shock, as Cynthia surveyed us in the area above us carefully. The skin of the old woman was pure white, but strangely mottled. Stalks of what looked like long, thick hairs had begun to slowly arch from cadaverous skin. These changes made Debbie decide that this was clearly a threat. In less time than it would take a normal person to take out their cell phone, Debbie whipped out a tiny gun from her waistband and shifted her body weight, placing her feet instinctively into what police call the weaver stance. George Trouble! I had already known George was coming the first time she called him, but now I got an idea as to why it took him a moment when he knew there was an issue tonight. I began to hear heavy footsteps making their way to us from some bedroom off to the side. George and his buddies were on the way. Two windows from the front of the house blew open. A quiet, angry, pip-pip-pip sound coming from each. A metallic clink in front of me followed, followed by two deafening blasts from Debbie's small handgun. My ears hurt like hell and I reeled backwards. I still get ringing in pain to this day from the shots. An incredible splatter occurred like hitting a water balloon with a baseball bat. Cynthia's face blew inwards, and her tiny body staggered back, but she was still moving. The shots didn't even knock her off her feet, which now had razor-sharp talons sticking through what used to be shoes. Her torso bent back at the waist at a nearly 90-degree angle, but she gracefully swept upright again just as quickly as the blasts had slowed her. What used to be a woman's face was now round, and a razor-sharp beak protruding below a small hole that was not nearly as bloody as it should have been. The bullet hole was closing itself rapidly. All of this happened within a few seconds, but it felt like we had hours to get a good look at what was planning on killing us. Debbie knocked me back with her shoulder, taking the air out of me. I fell back indoors. A horrific sound came from outside the door. An animal wail of rage and pain. It slowly gained in volume and pitch until becoming a terrifying shriek that echoed throughout the area. The thought of the police, for once, seemed to be on no one's mind. I began to run, not particularly thinking of where I was going. I remember going around a corner to the kitchen area to hide as I saw George walk out with a furious look on his face and a massive gun of some kind in his hands, and I kept running past him, towards the backyard doors and the couch where I had slept. I don't know a lot about guns, but I was willing to bet it was the kind of thing he would have picked up from the many military contacts the Aryan Brotherhood enjoyed. I peered around the corner and witnessed the massive giant pointed wildly after opening the door. Then he took a step back, angled his weapon, and closed the heavy door slightly in front of him, as if he were using it as a shield. He didn't fire, but the tip of the weapon explored the area in front of him very carefully, as if looking for something. We heard what sounded like a ragged grunt, just barely resembling the hoot of an owl. From the front of the house, we suddenly heard someone cry out and a single shot go off. I looked and can only assume they did too, but I didn't see whatever it was through the small windows. Within a few seconds, we heard a quick scream from the back of the house and a loud whoomp and cracking sound. George stared down at the ground again in the same area before slamming the door and calling a few friends, as well as the police. Seeing a neo-Nazi with an illegal weapon call the police is how you know things have gone to shit. 
I couldn't quite hear that call. He then went to a small panel about ten feet from the front door in the foyer and began flipping switches on. Floodlights turned on all around the house, making the front and backyard even more clearly lit than it usually was in daytime. With a loud bang, shutters dropped in front of all but a few of the thin vertical slits of windows around the home. The moment those lights came on, a horrible wet sound came from the backyard, like a bunch of wet celery being broken in half. Apparently, we had interrupted Cynthia with whatever she was doing, because I saw a brief flurry of movement coming from the top of the jacuzzi. At this juncture, I did the only sane thing you may ever hear of me doing. I looked around the room, saw the small handgun sitting on top of the coffee table I had sat at last night, and I made a beeline for it. I grabbed it and for a second tried to make it comfortable in my hands, but the strangely masculine weight of the weapon informed me that this was simply never going to happen. As I quickly leaned over the couch to attempt to get the hell away from where Cynthia last was, I barely remembered to keep the gun barrel from pointing directly at me while I awkwardly maneuvered to the center of the home where the kitchen was, hoping to avoid being in the middle of Cynthia or the neo-Nazis. A massive wham that I felt before I heard shook the entire building as George's gun went off for the first time. I didn't bother to look at the front door as I heard one of the skinheads shouting something from one side of the house. The gun went off again, but I could only feel it this time. All I heard was ringing. I slumped against the kitchen cabinet, my shirt ripping on a handle. I tried to slow my breathing. I could feel an unpleasant tingling and knew that if I kept breathing quickly, I could easily hyperventilate. The beam of light coming from the slightly open front door widened rapidly, and a shadow moved across it as another incredible concussive blast forced the wall to vibrate angrily. From where I was sitting, the window slit to the backyard were still visible, and in one of them, movement caught my eye. In the jacuzzi, an arm was now dangling from the side. At first, I tried not to look at it, but I realized quickly that it was still moving. I turned to see what was happening out the front door and saw one of the skinheads opening fire into the air from one of the window slits, desperately trying to aim at something. George was out the front door in the middle of the street, but moving carefully back inside, pounding ammunition up at something I could only guess used to be Cynthia. Debbie was nowhere to be seen, but brief flashes of light from the other side of the house implied that she was still doing her best. If there was any chance of that guy living, I had to quit being a pussy. I climbed to my feet and flicked the safety off of the tiny gun. My knees felt like they simply weren't built for a lumbering fat guy of my size and awkwardness. I was shaking so badly that every step towards the back door felt perilous, as if my legs might give out if my foot landed just wrong. When I reached the back door, I looked towards the front where Debbie was reloading George's massive gun while George aimed through the crack in the door with some kind of assault rifle. I was grateful that I couldn't hear it, but worried that it might be permanent. I took a deep breath and opened the door. Thankfully, my feet had more competence when I allowed them to run as fast as they possibly could. I could see the arm of what I assumed was one of the skinheads, covered in blood and furiously straining to pull himself up by the side of the jacuzzi, near a pile of pool equipment. I began to aim my wild run towards and up the side of the small hill. I attempted to look up in the sky, but didn't see anything. Flashes of light from inside the house gave me hope that Cynthia didn't notice me yet. When I reached the top of the hill, I noticed that a tiny degree of my hearing had returned. I heard the angry pops coming from the front of the house in one ear, and a voice that seemed strained and weak. Help. Help. Get. I could barely hear the words over the initiation of tinnitus and din of combat. I looked inside the half-finished hot tub and saw what used to be Kyle. The bottom of the vat-like construction was filled with blood. One blue eye peered up at me from a blood-covered head. The other was a mess of gore where specks of bright white or deep yellow occasionally showed through. Kyle was laying in what was supposed to be a hot tub seat, 
one arm over the edge of the jacuzzi, waving weakly towards the pile of pool cleaning supplies. On his lap, and in the bottom of the tub, Cynthia's innards moved slowly over him. His other hand had been taken in by the viscera, which pulsed slightly as it pulled his shattered arm in. The snake-like organs were wrapped around his legs and lower body, tightening slowly. Kill. Kill it. Heil barely managed to gasp out while using his one remaining limb to gesture towards the pool supplies. Amidst the cleaning nets, chemicals, and tiling equipment, a large shotgun had dropped there, but the barrel had been bent at an angle. Right behind it, a massive jug of chlorine loomed. I dropped my own firearm without even thinking that since the safety was off, it could have just gone off and killed me. I grabbed the massive jug of chlorine and tore off the cap in one motion, praying to God chlorine would work as well as whatever salt the Ais or the Jaga would use. By the time I turned around, Kyle's hand was limp, and his eye was no longer staring at anything in particular. I poured the jug out as quickly as I could on the sinuous intestines, making a thick cloud of acrid smoke that burned everything from my nostrils to my lungs. I pulled my head away and saw the deep red guts turn black and bubble. Much of what had pooled at the bottom of the tub had begun to congeal and turn from scarlet to a disgusting black and green fluid. Then, I fell down. At some point... It didn't take long. Debbie slapped me in the face and began pulling my arm frantically. I came out of my stupor to see Kyle's friend Steve staring up at us with a horrified look, but I could only hear Debbie telling me to move it. She held me up as we walked down the hill and back into the house, where Kyle's friend kept ahead of us with a quick trot until we reached the front of the house. George was standing in front of the door with his massive gun, looking a little confused. Is it over? Steve asked in a whisper. George got into position and slowly opened the door, with the gun searching for a movement before he pulled the door open wider. Finally, he stepped out entirely, cautiously keeping the weapon trained on an area in front of us in the road. When I finally peered out myself, I saw the crimson wreck that used to be Cynthia. She had fallen near her car. Even from the distance, it was clear that she was no longer in her unnatural Stegini shape. Tatters of her clothing showed red, splattered human skin underneath. We approached her cautiously, but backed away in a shock when one of her hands moved just slightly. Her torso was absurdly thin, as if she had been squeezed in the middle by a giant. Her gore-covered face and eyes were aimed at us but no longer showed signs of life. Trails cut through the gore on her face from her eyes to the ground as the last tears fell from her dead eyes. Thank fucking God. Debbie's voice sounded like it was coming from far away. The scintillating pain and monotone sound and what I would come to know as my bad ear were much louder. I felt George clap a hand to my shoulder as if to tell me I did a good job but I didn't bother to look at him. We got our stories straight after a moment of gawking, once the incoming sounds of sirens told us the police had enough of our nonsense. Three massive SUVs pulled up and the men inside jumped out almost at once, with weapons aimed at us. George knew this would happen, and told us to wait with our hands over our heads. They took us in before we even had time to close the front door. We told the police we didn't see how Cynthia died. We told them Kyle fell while playing with a gun and hit his head. We decided to say that we didn't see that either, which in retrospect was retarded. Strangely enough, we were released the next morning anyways. The gruff and quiet brutes who took us in were replaced by a young blonde woman and an older looking guy with thinning hair and a wiry build. She listened to everything we said and smiled and nodded while he angrily took down notes. At the end of a long interview with a lot of strange questions, we were released from what turned out to be an FBI office. George's home was picked almost clean when we got out, but they ignored the drugs and firearms entirely. 
slowly but surely. We heard less and less about it, and within three days, when I called the Palm Beach Sheriff's Office for information on court hearings or whatever, I was hung up on. When I called the friendly blonde woman from the FBI, she cheerfully told me the case had been closed. The authorities, in general, seemed to want nothing to do with it. Debbie told me that this wasn't unexpected. Cynthia's body never made it home. Carl reported her missing within a day and became absolutely inconsolable in a very short time. He didn't seem to show any inclination towards vomiting out his intestines and attacking me, just getting as many drugs as possible. I was mainly worried that Carl had more family I had to be aware of. He would never see his mother again and would never find out why. Four days later, right after Christmas, he overdosed. For good this time and from the pills I gave him. I think about that a lot, and generally drink a lot on Christmas. I wonder if Cynthia did whatever she did to protect Carl. I wonder if she ever had a bad bone in her body, or if I had driven her to a new extreme by slowly murdering her son, pill by pill. I used to tell myself that he was just a guy who made shitty choices, but I can see the reality now. If it weren't for me, they, and too many others, would still be alive. But I'm selfish. The only thing I could think about was the fact that there were three of them at the beach. Not just two. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please tune in next week for chapters 5 through chapters 9 and the thrilling conclusion to Scott Wilson's The Pill Mills. You've been listening to The Pill Mills, written by Scott Wilson. Scott Wilson was born in Seattle, Washington and raised in West Palm Beach, Florida. When he is not penning tales of terror, he enjoys kayaking and hiking in addition to reading and writing. Wilson loves exploring historical places in his general area, especially anything pre-colonial, and loves reading historical nonfiction. His personal favorite writers are Stephen King, Laird Barron, and Philip K. Dick. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Horror Hill. A production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. And a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh, and if you could, please leave a kind word or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already, 
be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, this is Jason Hill. Good evening.